a key ingredient that separates us and those that are able to send uh, citizens to go and work in these countries as being this training that Senator Tabitha wants us to request NITA uh, to infuse into our curriculum so that the many young men and women that go to work in the Middle East can have sufficient competence that also at a multilateral level, Mr. Speaker, we are able to enter into the necessary arrangements that will open up the job market for our young people, not just the manual jobs that many people are used to, but including skilled labor as well. And you remember that when you engage those Kenyans, they challenge us as the leaders in the country. And I'm glad that Senator Tabitha has remembered actually to follow through on the promise that we gave those Kenyans uh, living in Dubai, that we shall ensure that we push NITA to introduce these exit courses. Many of them are not even to do with technical details, but just basic fine etiquette, cultural challenges that they'll uh, face when they get to that uh, part of the country, their rights, and very basic things which, for lack of which, uh, Mr. Speaker, on many occasions, many Kenyans end up uh, falling afoul of the law and are locked up or lose job opportunities. But even on the more serious front, uh, Mr. Speaker, we cannot access some of the jobs that are available because Kenya has not signed the necessary uh, bilaterals with this country because of this specific training, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, once you commit this to the uh, uh, committee, the relevant uh, departmental committee to handle it, it is my sincere wish, Mr. Speaker, that they will expedite this and NITA will come and give a commitment before this House so that we know in the next uh, few months if there are amendments uh, that they want us to do that will enforce and ensure that before uh, Kenyans leave the country, they have undergone this uh, training and that we can go back each time because we see the President visiting uh, different parts of the world. And this is something that we can brandish and show them that our uh, uh, workers are actually fully prepared for the labor market in any part of the world, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, it is my most sincere hope that uh, the departmental committee that you'll refer this matter to will demand of NITA that we complete on this exercise so that Ministry of Foreign Affairs can move ahead and do that which is necessary so that ordinary Kenyans can access job opportunities uh, that are available. And on, on, their only missing ingredient, actually, is what Senator Tabitha is reminding us of. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senator Mbon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me an opportunity to also input into this uh, statement by Senator Tabitha. Uh, speaker, a few minutes ago when I walked into the chamber, and my colleague, Senator Sifuna, was very worried that I'm wearing green. He thought I am joining Ford Kenya. But I gave him the assurance that um, I'm in green today as an outward manifestation of the peace that we stand for in this house and outside the house. The speaker, this statement by the Senator Tabitha it may sound a simple statement, but my thinking, Mr. Speaker, is that this should actually be the genesis of coming up with a legislation to not only safeguard the labor rights of our children and citizens working outside the country, but also to properly equip them as they go to take up uh, jobs in other uh, countries. Mr. Speaker, we must all appreciate that Kenya has become a major source market for cheap and semi-skilled labor, especially in the Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, and um, in the EU and the USA for semi-skilled labor, especially 
in home care services. The speaker, the hundreds of thousands of young people that fly through JKIA to take up jobs outside the country is reason good enough for the National Industrial Training Authority to take the training of these immigrant workers a lot more seriously and train them, Mr. Speaker, even on some very basic things, like basic accounting, to know when it is that they are supposed to, once they get their paycheck, when they are supposed to exchange their money and when to hold and wait until the rates are better in the market for them to do the exchanges, for them to know their rights as workers outside this country, for them, Mr. Speaker, to also be able to contribute to the national economy back home while they work outside the country. The speaker, this training will be very, very necessary, and not just for the workers, but equally important for staff working in recruitment agencies in this country. So that as they prepare these workers, then they are properly equipped. The speaker, in conclusion, it should be appreciated by all of us that for us, the export of cheap and semi-skilled labor in the areas in the countries that where we export, for us, it is business as a country. And it's business that must bring returns uh, both to the workers and to the economy of this country. The speaker, I support. Senator Mungatama. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to associate myself with the comments of the honorable senators who have spoken before me. But Mr. Speaker, there is an important key word that is missing in all the submissions. It is not general training, it is credibility of these trainings, Mr. Speaker, that this education committee must seek out. Why? Because, Mr. Speaker, from my experience in the courts, the agents who take our children, they don't give them the real requirements that are necessary for their successful execution of the duties that they are going to undertake in the foreign countries. Mr. Speaker, this statement, and I hope the Committee of Education captures the real thing, they must investigate the credibility of those certificates that are awarded here. The certificates, are they credible? And Mr. Speaker, I am inviting the committee to ask information from the NIS, NSIS, from the DCI. And Mr. Speaker, why? Because there was a scandal, a big scandal, Mr. Speaker that our children are given certificates through these agents. And when they go there, when these people call, they discover that, in fact, this particular person who is being employed never went through that course. They have no idea. Mr. Speaker, it is really tarnishing the image of our country as a great supplier of trained labor. So, Mr. Speaker, I am asking the Committee of Education to really go deep. They must get private information on what has been happening. I am aware, Mr. Speaker, that that scandal involved some people within that institution being arrested and prosecuted. And I'm sure the Honorable Senator Tabitha must have heard this because this happened here in Nairobi. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I am asking these people to go deep into it, not just to talk 
uh, to look at uh, general standards and what, we must know electronic databases. If you say you are taking plumbers, we must have a proper database, proper qualification. When did this person go in? When did he come out? What were the grades? How long was the training? So that those, because ele electronics in most cases, they don't lie. They are less prone to human error. So Mr. Speaker, I am, I am praying that like other senators have said, a proper report be brought here so that we can look at it and possibly legislation to be fashioned in such a way that we, we, we guard the dignity of the kind of labor force, the quality of labor force that Kenya is known, is known for abroad. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Senators, we spent um, considerable time on this particular statement. Uh, we will move to the next. Senator Wamatinga Wahome. Senator Ledama, under Standing Order 51, we are only given under one hour to prosecute all the statements. If we spend more time on just one, we may not make any headway. Senator Matinga, proceed, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I also like to support this statement. <laughs> Senator Wamatinga. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that has been closed. That's, uh, sorry, Mr. Speaker, sir. I, I, to request for I'm you, guided. Sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Yes, I do have a time, Mr. Speaker, sir. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, I like to request on a statement on the acquisition of land in areas earmarked for national projects and disposing of exorbitant prices to the government. Mr. Speaker, sir, I like to pursue to Standing Order 53-1 to seek statement from the Standing Committee on RAD and natural resources on irregularities in land acquisition for dam construction projects. In the statement, the committee should, one, provide the list and particulars of parcels of land acquired by the National Land Commission for the purpose of the dam construction project since 2020. States the amount paying, paid for them as compensation to the respective owners and indicating the market value of those parcels. Two, investigate and table the findings on the report of corruption and conspiracy between individuals, companies, and officials of the Ministry of Lands and Housing and Urban Development and the National Land Commission and at sea to acquire land in anticipation of projects and dispose them to the government for, at exorbitant prices for these projects, thereby occasioning loss for money by the taxpayer. Three, state the action to be taken against those involved including measures to surcharge them for the laws of the government, and for state measures being taken to promote awareness to committees whose land has been marked by the, for the government projects from disposing their land to conspicuous and spookless and land speculators. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senator Ledam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to support the statement by the distinguished senator from Kirinyaga. No, from Meru. Nyeri. Mr. Speaker, the, from the chair of energy. Let me put it that way. This is a very important statement. It's a very important statement because so often we violate sec, uh, Article 68 uh, C2 of the Constitution, which is supposed to regulate on how land move from one use to another. And so often, Mr. Speaker, you'll find that even when land is acquired to be used for government uh, projects, that land, the land use policy is never adhered to. So Mr. Speaker, sir, I'd like to request the committee that you'll task that report to to do an analysis of all the land that has been acquired and whether the land use policy and whether Article 68 um, 
C2 of the Constitution was complied with. That is issue number one. Number two, Mr. Speaker, lest we forget that in most cases, all the scandals we get in this country relates to the land that is acquired for government projects. If history serves me right, Mr. Speaker, when land was being acquired along Milolongo and the landowners were, being, were paid money so that they make way for the expressway, and also when land was being acquired to be able to create that link, the link road to um, Runda, or rather to Gashie, and even this one for Kilimani, people were hiding documents and going to courts to be able to seek for more money. And you will find that a lot of people who work in the lands department were being complicit. So Mr. Speaker, it will be important that the lands committee go to a, a greater extent in trying to identify what parcels of land have already been you know, earmarked to be used for land projects, for, for government projects. Because this business where people, when they know that the government is going to be doing a huge dump, they sell the land at exorbitant prices, it is really costing Kenyans and taxpayers a lot of money. So Mr. Speaker, this statement is very, very important. And I hope that those issues that I've raised here can be included in that statement so that we can actually be able, on an every year basis, we can be able to know how much money is the Ministry of Land going to use to be able to acquire land for government projects. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senator Cheptumo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also arise to support the statement by the Senator Nyeri. Uh, Mr. Speaker, construction of dams in our country helps to avail water to our citizens. But a lot of these dams, Mr. Speaker, have actually been frustrated because of a number of factors. Um, in my practice of law, Mr. Speaker, I have had cases where there is conflict between the citizens and the government because of compensation. So that, Mr. Speaker, there is no public participation between the relevant uh, ministry and the public. Because, uh, Mr. Speaker, you talk of a situation where people have to surrender their portions of land for their dams to be done. And for, for them to surrender their pieces of land, they should be compensated. So the process of compensation is another issue which I want this committee to look into. So that, Mr. Speaker, the value for the land should be given to the, 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 owner, the owners of the land in terms of the real value. Sometimes there is undervalue. And sometimes, Mr. Speaker, there is overvaluing of the land. So that a piece of land that's supposed to be a million per acre can actually even go for three million per acre because of certain considerations and certain understandings between officials or Minister of Lands and the Minister of uh, Roads and so on. So that is another area which I want the committee to look, to look, to look, uh, to look into, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if you go to lands uh, land, the National Land Commission today and you look at the pending bills on unpaid claims where certificates have been issued by the commission, it is in billions, Mr. Speaker. And one wonders why, because once a government has decided to either build a road or a dam, they allocate the money for that particular purpose. Money for the dam itself to be constructed and money for compensation. So, Mr. Speaker, you wonder then, then how come we have huge uh, bills in terms of unpaid bills in this, in this um, in, in National Land Commission? And the owners of that pieces of land are subjected to a lot of suffering. And they are told to, be the, to, be, to go to Treasury 
and look for um, the pending bills to be paid. So it is another area, Mr. Speaker, I want the committee, and I'm a member of this committee, and my chair is here. We need to interrogate also that issue. How come money set aside for either compensation or for the dams end up not being available to the owners of this pieces of land. So, Mr. Speaker, it's a very important uh, uh, statement, and I want to agree that this House should be able to rise up through the committee and ensure that citizens who have suffered because of non-payment of the money for compensation or for, for, for their pieces of land should be able to be uh, compensated accordingly. I support Mr. Speaker. Senator Muma. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I rise to support um, and to contribute uh, to that statement. Mr. Speaker, I think beyond the issue of speculation on land for infrastructure development, uh, I think that committee needs to look at the issue of social risk management in infrastructure development in Kenya. Mr. Speaker, Beyond just the compens compensation of land, we have had a lot of community and government conflict over a number of projects that have had to be stopped because communities rose and objected to those projects proceeding for one reason or other. And as Senior Cheptumo says, this goes to the issue of public participation. Oftentimes, we have had no public participation where a location is identified for development and the communities are not consulted and we end up with a conflict. Maybe the, the piece of land that is being picked is even sentimental, has cultural value, has religious value, and we have not taken this issue seriously. Mr. Speaker, Beyond this, I am recommending that that committee looks at the issues of social risk management in infrastructure development in Kenya so that we can develop a policy that can guide on reasonable compensation as well as looking at other social risks to development projects. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next statement, Senator James Murango. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have two statements. Mr. Speaker, I rise pursuant to Standing Order 53-1 to seek assessment from the Standing Committee on National Security and Foreign Relations regarding establishment of more police stations, police posts, and police patrol bases in Kenya County. In the statement, the committee should, one, List the electoral wants and administrative locations and administrative sample locations without a police station or a police post or even police patrol bases in Kenya County to state the stopgap measures in place to ensure that security in the affected areas is enhanced. And three, explain that explain what measures are in place to establish police stations, police posts, and patrol bases in those areas. My second statement, Mr. Speaker, I rise in pursuant to standing order 531 to seek a statement from the Standing Committee on Roads and Transportation regarding the status of the project to upgrade Kutus, Kembembe, Kanjinji, PI Road in Kirinyaga County to bitumen standard. In the statement, the committee should, one, provide an an update on the status of construction of the road, which is crucial to the economy of Kenya County and whose construction started in 2022, but has since stalled. Two, provide details of the total contract sum for the project and state the cost implication occasioned by the delay in its completion. Three, indicate where the contractor will resume works on the stone project and also state the expected date of completion. And four, state the measures that the contractor will put in place to reduce dust emissions which has become a health hazard to the residents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Senator Siango. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to support the statement by Senator James Morango of Kirinyaga County. Uh, looking at the establishment of uh, police uh, stations, police posts, and uh, patrol bases, not only in uh, Kirinyaga County, as he has indicated, but also in other counties. Uh, sometimes I wonder, looking at the their living conditions and the standards of the uh, security personnel. Some of them live under very poor conditions. Yes, the stations are established, but they are not, uh, the facilities there are lacking and uh, even the, the standards are very poor. Sometimes we have been crying, Mr. Speaker, of the corruption of our police uh, people but they are subjected to some situations where then for them to survive and to live, they would even uh, request for very little to get in exchange of service. Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, establishment of these uh, ports and uh, patrol bases is very necessary because Kenyans need security. And it is important that uh, even the ratio of uh, policemen to the civilian or to the people should be improved so that uh, uh, security is also improved. Mr. Speaker, sir, I also wonder on the budgetary allocation to the security personnel where, the, where these uh, security people are leaving, the policemen and women who are serving in this nation. Uh, I think it is important to be considered that this is increased so that they live in a honorable situation or manner that they will serve the Kenyans with a lot of dignity and with commitment to their work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Senator Kisong. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I rise to support the statement by the Senator in terms of increasing the number of police stations and police posts and patrols. Honorable Speaker, you know, when you increase the numbers of police stations, it means you're increasing the number of police officers in areas. It is, it's, I think we can propose that every sublocation should have either a police station or a police post to enhance security in those areas. And it's not only in Kirinyaka County alone, Honorable Speaker, also other areas, especially where it is prone to banditry and insecurity like along Kerio Valley. I know some communities across the country, Honorable Speaker, they have put up police po stations, police posts, pol patrols, uh, using their own resources or using uh, CDF or county funds, but majority of them, especially in North Drift, have not been cassetted. The National Police Service have not even posted police officers that would have assisted in enhancing security in those areas. Honorable Speaker, this is very important. It's good to know that uh, the Constitution uh, ensures that the, the, the government ensures the lives of the people and its property or their property are secured and protected. I asked for a statement about five weeks ago about a uh, uh, statement of police stations in Elge Maraquet County and beginning of operation in that region. Up to now, Honorable Speaker, six or so weeks uh, down the line, I have not received a feedback or, uh, for that statement. That's why I think it is important that the amendments that we are discussing yesterday have passed today so that the CSS come to their house and we put them to task and ask additional supplementary questions like uh, instead of uh, asking so many statements and they go and answer. Honorable Speaker, I support the statement by the senator from Grignac County. Senator Beatrice Akinye. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the chance to contribute to the noble uh, statement that has been brought to the floor by the Honorable Senator for Kirinyaga County, uh, Senator James Murango. Uh, Honorable Speaker, as we talk about uh, the establishment of more police stations, more police posts and police patrol bases in Karanyaga County, 
It is only important that the committee considers equity across the county because the noble services that the police provide for Kenyans is needed across our country. But Honorable Speaker, as we establish this police post, let us also think about the welfare of the police officers. Let us also think about the salaries of police officers. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, there has been a challenge uh, with the police salaries, especially regarding police officers that have gone on for further studies. Mr. Speaker, uh, the world over, we encourage our young people to go for further studies. But in other disciplines, Honorable Speaker, you find that once the professions have gone, the professionals have furthered their studies, their employers upgrade their salaries. But this has not been happening, Honorable Speaker, with the police force. We've heard a lot of cry with police officers who have studied and gone and achieved university uh, education. Honorable Speaker, people acquire education to enhance their performance, their skills, and their understanding of what work that they do. But we find a police force that once they struggle to go for further studies, then you come back to your station, you are neither upgraded, your salary is not upgraded. So Honorable Speaker, it looks like we are not motivating our police or officers once they go for further studies. And Honorable Speaker, I come back to the welfare of the general police officer in terms of their housing. A few of them live in a bit of comfort. But Honorable Speaker, if you travel across this country, uh, you'd go to tears because of some the state of the housing of some of the police posts that we have. Honorable Speaker, you cannot expect an officer to give you security as they secure you, as they secure your businesses, as they secure your working places, then they go back to live in deplorable uh, houses, Honorable Speaker. So, Honorable Speaker, as we address their housing, as we address the issue of establishing more posts, we must ensure the government must ensure that the police officers are housed adequately, uh, that they are also accorded the respect that other professions are accorded. Honorable Speaker, let me remind Kenyans of what we saw on Monday the 20th when we had the demos that were called by Azimio. Uh, the police have been in the middle of the, the fix, the conflict. I saw the, con uh, the, press, the pressers that were given by the KK, expectations that they had about the police officers. Uh, they had the expectation that the police officers should do particular things to the demonstrators. On our side, as a Zimio, we also expected the police officers uh, to protect the, uh, the protesters, to protect uh, the businesses of Kenyans. But here are police officers who are in the middle of a conflict when they go back to their, uh, to their welfare, they are, as we were demonstrating, I was one of the people who were demonstrating on that day, I saw police officers from 8 o'clock, uh, Honorable Speaker, up to evening, running around protesters without even water, without even milk, without even anything to support themselves. And so that is why I'm saying, Honorable Speaker, that as we establish uh, Honorable Speaker, that as we establish police post, it is good because, yes, because Kenyans need the services of police officers. But the government must go to give the requisite uh, uh, provisions that go with the establishment of the police post. Honorable Speaker, I support this noble statement. Next statement. Uh, Senator Samson. That statement is deferred. Uh, majority Leader.
Mr. Speaker, sir, I rise pursuant to standing order number 571. I hear I rise pursuant to standing order number 571 to present the statement of the business of the Senate for the week commencing Tuesday, the 28th of March 2023. Mr. Speaker, sir, there are 19 bills which are before the Senate for consideration at the second reading stage. Ten of these bills are scheduled in today's order paper. Four were read a first time yesterday and are committed to the respective standing committees pursuant to standing order number 145-1. The remaining five bills will be scheduled in the order paper for second reading upon the conclusion of the 30-day period committee, uh, for committees to report on bills. One other bill is listed in the order paper at number 20 at the committee and is at the committee of the whole stage. Mr. Speaker, it's important for chairpersons of committee to note the revised statutory time as per our standing orders, the time period which committees have to consider bills once they've been read a first time in this house. We are seeing a trend that is cropping in, Mr. Speaker, where after the 30-day period, committees begin to request the house to either extend time or give them additional few days to consider the business that is before them. It is too early in our parliamentary calendar, Mr. Speaker, to encourage such practices. I'd wish to request your good offices that you stick and be firm. Once the 30-day period lapses, let us proceed and debate the bill. In any case, Mr. Speaker, there is nothing in our standing orders that bars debate on second reading on any particular bill on absence of a report of the committee. Mr. Speaker, in fact, I have argued before on this floor that this issue of the committee report and second reading is a chicken and egg situation, such that many other times when members read through the committee report, then it projects their thinking to a particular direction. Yet, if we want to hear the an adulterated opinion of members on what they plainly think about a particular issue, then that is a time that the committee needs to sit down and listen to the debate, take into consideration the views of the members, and perhaps uh, uh, include them actually in their final findings when they present a report to this House that will guide us when you're going to third reading. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I request that we stick to the statutory 30-day period that is provided by our standing orders. As I have enumerated, Mr. Speaker, our legislative agenda is beginning to get heavy. It will be necessary for the Senate to expeditiously conclude on these bills within the second session. I therefore urge the respective movers to be available in the Senate whenever the, these bills are scheduled in the order paper. I also urge respective standing Just committees. A, a moment, uh, Majority Leader. What is your point of order, Senator? Mr. Speaker, uh, I didn't want to interrupt the majority leader when he's giving his statement for the upcoming week. But I got concerned with one statement, whereby if in this House we are to debate bills in the second reading without considering um, the committee reports, that committee report normally enrich the debate because the law requires us, I think it's Article 118 of the Constitution, to consider public participation. So, Mr. Speaker, I would like to beseech the majority leader that the 30 days, I'm happy with the 30 days, and I think we should stick to the 30 days. But in the event that we are debating a bill without taking into consideration what the citizens who we are required to take their views into consideration, if we debate that bill without their input, we will actually be bypassing and also violating the Constitution. So, Mr. Speaker, I didn't really want to disrupt his line of thoughts, but I want him to reconsider that thought because the second reading is very important. Normally, the third reading, during the third reading, Senator, we don't even have time Ledama, to do anything. What is out of order? with what uh, the majority leader... My, my concern, Mr. Speaker, is that... No, 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 not the your majority concern. Leader, what is, what is out not of order? Not your concern. What is what out is, of order, Mr. Proceed, Speaker? Proceed, proceed. 
is if this house adopts a, a, a process or rather a culture of debating, of going debating bills in the second reading without considering the committee report, we will be violating Article 118 of the Constitution. That is the issue in terms of public participation. Uh, if uh, that is your persuasion, uh, Senator Ledama, then you may have to move to amend the standing orders. Because the standing orders are very clear that uh, once committed to the committee, the committee has 30 days uh, within which to do all that that uh, you're talking about, public participation and any other acts that ought to be done uh, prior to tabling uh, the report. So failure of the committee then cannot be visited upon the House. And uh, the standing orders are very clear that uh, upon the expiry of that period, the House can proceed. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's incumbent um, upon the, um, the committee that uh, whose bill um, has been committed to, to make sure that uh, you act within the 30 days window. I'll give you an example that I, I heard the other day from the chair of uh, agriculture. A letter was written to me seeking my, um, uh, my approval to extend the 30 days period. I dug through our standing orders and I did not find anywhere where the speaker has powers to extend the 30 day period. So I wouldn't want to exercise the power that I don't have. And uh, if you read uh, this, this section following, uh, the, the standing order that gives the 30 days, clearly after the 30 days, the house can proceed the first reading. So if you want to neaten out as per your concern, then it's a matter that must be either through amendment of the standing orders, or but as the standing orders stand now, after the expiry of the 30 days, the House can proceed. So the committee has only those 30 days to do its work. Those are our standing orders, and as a chair, I have no powers whatsoever to extend that period. It is a question that we grappled with um, at, at the S SBC. It is a question that I grappled with when I was served with that particular letter. And uh, it is our position. That is the position provided for and our standing orders. Proceed, ML. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, my colleague needs to read standing order number 148 too. But I'm, I'm concerned about something, Mr. Speaker that you're, you're, you're trading into a dangerous ground, where when I'm presenting my statements, if somebody, maybe for one reason or the other, you don't agree or disagree, then you open it up for debate, then I will never be able to uh, do my statement, uh, Mr. Speaker. So I, I seek your protection, because what Senator Ledam was raising is a point of debate, not, not a point of order. Anyway, I proceed, Mr. Speaker. Number four, Mr. Speaker, sir, with respect to petitions, the Senate has received 10 petitions that have been committed to the respective standing committees pursuant to standing order number 238-1. I urge committee chairpersons to spearhead the timely procession, processing of the petitions within 60-day period as per the provisions of standing order number 238-2. As it is now, two petitions are already due for reporting by the standing committee on roads and transportation and the standing committee on agriculture, livestock, and fisheries, respectively. Five, statements are increasingly being sought pursuant to standing order number 53 and other issues pursuant to standing order number 52. I urge standing committees to expeditiously consider the statements and report back to the House. Mr. Speaker, sir, in conclusion, on Tuesday the 28th of March 2023, the Senate Business Committee will consider and approve business for the day this will contain business that will not be concluded from today's order paper and any other business scheduled by the Senate Business Committee. The order paper for Wednesday 29th March uh, 2023 and for Thursday 30th March 2023 will contain business that will not be concluded on Tuesday 28th March 2023 and on Wednesday 29th March 2023 respectively. The Senate Business Committee 
will also schedule any other business as well as petitions and statements pursuant to standing orders. I end by highlighting that pursuant to the calendar of the Senate approved on the 16th of February 2023, the Senate will proceed on a short recess at the rise of the House on Thursday, the 30th of March, that is next week Thursday. It is therefore imperative that bills and motions be prioritized during a plenary sitting. I thank you and hereby lay the statement on the table of the Senate. Thank you. Honorable Senators, before we move to the next order, I have uh, two communications to make. Honorable Senators, I would like to acknowledge the presence in the Speaker's Gallery this afternoon, Mr. Wisely Abuya, a Hansard reporter from the County Assembly of Wasinigishu, who is on a one-week benchmarking visit on Hansard Audiovisual Solution and the Senate. Honorable Senators, I request him to stand to be acknowledged. Here he is and the Senate tradition. On behalf of the Senate and on my own behalf, I extend a warm welcome and wish him a fruitful visit. Again, honorable senators, I would like to acknowledge in the presence, uh, acknowledge the presence in the public gallery this afternoon, a visiting delegation from Condabilete High School in El Geo Maraquet County. The delegation comprises four teachers and 47 pupils in the Senate for a one-day study tour. Honorable Senators, in our usual tradition of receiving and welcoming visitors to Parliament, I extend a warm welcome to them, and on behalf of the Senate, and on my own behalf, wish them a fruitful visit. I will uh, allow Senator Kisang to give very short uh, welcoming remarks to both delegations. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I wish to welcome the two delegations to Senate chambers, to, I mean Senate today. Uh, Kondabili at Secondary School is in Maraquet West of Elga Maraquet County, and uh, this is a young school that was started in 2007 when I was, I, the first time I sought to be a member of parliament, but I didn't succeed. Then eventually 2013, 2017, I served that constituency for two terms as the member of parliament, and we used a lot of good resources from CDF, Maracuad West, to put up the school uh, infrastructure, put up houses for the teachers, and uh, even bought a bus. So I want to welcome them for the study. This is the uh, Senate of Kenya, and uh, your former MB was promoted from being a member of parliament to come to this honorable house. This is a upper house. This is where you have very mature MPs. Uh, we debate uh, here uh, to ensure that we do your representation, we do oversight, and the resources that we pass to the county, especially your county of El County, uh, we ensure that the governor and his executive uh, give you value for money. So uh, the two delegations welcome to the Senate of Kenya. We, I'll see you later on outside. Next order, Clark. Order number eight, the Division of Revenue Bill, National Assembly Bills number nine of 2023, First reading, a bill for an act of parliament to provide for the equitable division of revenue raised nationally between the national and county governments in 2023-24 financial year and for connected purposes. Next order. Order number nine, motion. Adoption of the fifth report of the Procedure and Rules Committee on the review of the standing orders of the Senate. Honorable Senators, uh, we will resume debate, which was uh, interrupted uh, yesterday, Wednesday, 22nd, March 2023. At uh, that juncture, the Honorable Senator Gloria uh, was actually on her feet contributing to this motion. She had a balance of four minutes. I'm not seeing her in the House, and therefore I will call upon uh, senators wishing to contribute 
to continue contributing. Senator Methu. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, for according me this opportunity to comment on the uh, on this motion, Mr. Speaker. I first would want to confirm that I rise to support. And uh, maybe before I make my contribution, I would want to, because I've not had an opportunity to congratulate uh, our two brothers who rose to the positions of leadership, Senator Sifuna and uh, Senator uh, Olekina. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, as I rise to support this motion, just this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, we have had uh, very many statements from uh, uh, different senators on very different uh, issues. And uh, they are being committed to uh, different committees of the House. We have just gotten a statement from uh, the senator for Kirinyaga uh, uh, on uh, the establishment of police, uh, police stations, police, station, uh, police posts, and police patrol bases in Kirinyaga. And uh, just about two weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, the senator for Kirinyaga was uh, arrested for holding demonstrations in uh, Kiamanyeki for uh, a very unfortunate death of two brothers who were very, uh, brutally killed, Mr. Speaker, um, whose burial is on this Saturday. Mr. Speaker, uh, the reason why I want to support this motion, why I believe that uh, cabinet secretaries should get a platform and should get a way of coming to answer questions, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, this question that has been raised by Senator uh, for Kirinyaga, and indeed many other senators who, uh, who raised statements in this House, uh, if uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Interior had an opportunity to come to this House, Mr. Speaker, he would be, number one, the right person with all the requisite information, Mr. Speaker, uh, that the Senator for Kirinyaga and indeed, indeed all the other Senators who seek statements in this statement, uh, in this uh, uh, House uh, would want. Mr. Speaker, I was surprised yesterday when our colleagues from the opposition were opposing what, in my view, is, uh, has been their push uh, through and through. When they seek statements and they ask uh, that I want answers from the Cabinet Secretary for this uh, ministry, the Cabinet Secretary for this ministry, Cabinet Secretary for this ministry, Mr. Speaker, like if we had an opportunity with the Senator for Kiambu now, we would be very glad to hear from the Minister for Agriculture, uh, Midika Lintuli, on why fertilizer has not uh, been distributed to uh, uh, our counties in uh, Nyandarwa and uh, Kiambu when it is planting season, Mr. Speaker. Instead of uh, I raising a statement, then I'll go to the Committee on Agriculture, then they'll have to go again to the PS and the CS. I would be very glad to get the answers directly from the Cabinet Secretary on why fertilizer has not been distributed to uh, Nyandaro County. Uh, some of the issues that we require, Mr. Speaker, they require very urgent and uh, immediate answers. Sometimes, Mr. Speaker, uh, there are questions that are being asked in this House uh, about uh, uh, a campaign that was ongoing of a very sad state of uh, the circumstances under which a, a, a young man, Geoffrey uh, Mwadi, uh, met his uh, unfortunate uh, demise. Mr. Speaker, if the cabinet secretary was able to come here, we do not, we do not have the luxury of uh, time of asking the Committee on Security led by Senator Cheptumo to go again, look for the uh, Inspector General, look for the DCI, look for the cabinet secretary, uh, Mr. Speaker, I am very convinced that we shall have cured very many issues. And I speak this, uh, Mr. Speaker, as a chairman of a committee that uh, deals with five cabinet secretaries and uh, 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 a chairman that gets statements for five or six different uh, state departments that I'm supposed to uh, give answers, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I support this motion. I, I believe and I am uh, I'm a firm believer, and I'm very happy that His Excellency the President, Dr. William Ruto, has followed through what he promised when he appeared before Parliament when he was making his inaugural address, when he was uh, addressing Parliament for the first time as Speaker. He promised that uh, to ensure that uh, we are able to play our oversight role on the executive, he will ensure 
and we should be able to uh, give a mechanism to have his cabinet secretaries come to parliament so that they can be able to answer uh, questions from members of parliament because Article 1 of the Constitution, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, says that sovereignty, uh, sovereign power belongs to the people. They can exercise it directly or through their elected representatives. We are the elected representatives, Mr. Speaker. So when we have been given an opportunity to be asking questions directly from the executive, to be asking questions directly for, uh, from the cabinet secretaries, then we should be, we should be able to uh, ensure that we build that framework and have standing orders that will be support, uh, that will support that kind of framework. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, for uh, giving me an opportunity to contribute. Finally, Mr. Speaker, as I was walking in this afternoon, I have been greatly embarrassed by Senator Sifuna, and I think it is uh, important that I mention this, Mr. Speaker, because they keep telling us uh, that uh, uh, power is transient and many things. So when we were leaving uh, KICC, because his, my office and his office uh, just, uh, and uh, I didn't have a car, he was inviting me to drive in his government vehicle and he was telling me that this is, these are the things that you are opposing and you are now benefiting from them. So I want to tell you, uh, uh, just uh, Senator Sifuna, the same way I opposed to your rising to become the deputy minority whip and I have benefited from riding in your car, is the same way you shall benefit from cabinet secretaries coming to this house uh, when you get an opportunity to be asking those questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Senator Wamboa. Uh, I thank you, the speaker. The speaker, uh, from the onset and for the record, I want it to be recorded that, Mr. Speaker, I am opposed to this motion. Uh, <laughs> you oppose and then the mic goes off. Mr. Speaker, I am not opposed to this motion just for the purposes of opposing the motion. Mr. Speaker, I want and I want the majority leader to listen to this, but it's important that he listens to this. It is true, Mr. Speaker, that all of us in this House and in the National Assembly, we would want cabinet secretaries to appear before us so that we can interrogate and ask questions that will be lost in translation if they are answered through committees. We all want that. It will make the work of representation a lot more easier. The speaker, what we are opposed to and what I'm opposed to is the route that we use to get the cabinet secretaries to appear before the Senate. The speaker, the principle of separation of powers among the three arms of government in this country is well established. That separation, Mr. Speaker, that principle, extends beyond the academic categorization of the three arms, the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature. That separation finds meaning, Mr. Speaker, in the execution of the roles of those arms of government. Much as, Mr. Speaker, we all agree that these three arms of government need to complement each other in the execution of their roles for better service delivery to our people, we must be structured in the way that we create a platform for that complementary role to be played. Mr. Speaker, this constitution Kenyans gave themselves a presidential system of government. We had the option of going to a preliminary system or a hybrid system. But under Constitution 2010, the Kenyans agreed that the way to go would be a presidential system of government where the executive sits outside parliament. That's a conscious decision that we took as a nation. 
Mr. Speaker, the beauty of our constitution is that it does not put us in a straight jacket. It doesn't. It provides options and ways through which we can change the constitution and make provisions, especially on matters governance. The speaker, if there is a change or a shift in thinking as to what system of governance would best serve this country, if you want to go to parliamentary system or you want to go to a hybrid system, the speaker, the constitution has provisions on how we can do that. Mr. Speaker, what I am very and actually grossly opposed to is a situation, Mr. Speaker, where we want to use standing orders of the Senate to change the constitution of Kenya. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I have read through this report. This report, Mr. Speaker, invites senators who took oath of office to defend the Constitution, the Speaker, to change the constitutional provisions on our system of government through an amendment to a standing order. The Speaker, my submission is that yes, it will be important for cabinet service to appear before Senate, but let us use the right route to get them to the Senate. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senator Mungatana. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to also add my thinking. Mr. Speaker, I was listening to uh, the Honorable Senator Wambua, who is my neighbor. And Mr. Speaker, I respect the thinking behind his submissions. And that's why I want also him to listen to me carefully. Mr. Speaker, this constitution has provided a very clear way in which it is supposed to be interpreted. The Constitution does not invite each and every one of us to interpret it in the manner that we want. This Constitution has given a self-interpretation mechanism. And I wanted my honorable colleague to hear me out and I want probably if he has his constitution nearby and I know he has to, to, to read with me and I know this one the honorable Sifuna must have memorized it and also the speaker because we belong to the same breed but article of the constitution 259 construction of the constitution in construing this constitution, in interpreting this constitution, we have to interpret the constitution in four manners, A, B, C, and D. A, that it promotes its purposes, values, and principles. B, advances the rule of law and human rights and fundamental freedoms in the Bill of Rights. C, permits the development of the law, and D, contributes to good governance. Mr. Speaker, this constitution also gives a way that makes it very clear. Whenever you are interpreting the constitution, you expand the interpretation to allow for expansion of freedoms. You don't expand, you construe the constitution to construe or to construct those freedoms that have been guaranteed in this constitution. So, if you are interpreting the principles of freedom of separation of power, 
we have to interpret them in the manner that says we are expanding the space. So how are we expanding this space? Principles of good governance require accountability. And in fact, it's in our national values. Article 10 of the Constitution states that we must hold all public servants, all of them, to be accountable to us as a people. So, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to convince my colleague to see that by requiring those officers to come to this house, we are expanding and we are not construing the space of democracy in this country. I want him to be persuaded. Let us not oppose this motion, Mr. Speaker. I stand to very strongly support it. Mr. Speaker, I am inviting my colleague. Mr. Speaker, I, I can only be informed by my learned friend, maybe Sifuna, but uh, I don't want to be informed by him uh, for now. Honorable Senators, let me finish. Your, your request speaker. for information has been declined. Are you a learned friend? If you are not a learned friend, you can't inform me. Pro so, proceed, so, Senator Mgatana, proceed. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I was just about to wind up. I'm saying, I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, that sincerely and honestly, and I like the way Senator Enoch is, is, is talking here. He say, I am supporting this idea, but it's the method. What he, I, what he should do, he should take comfort in the fact that we are on the same bench, same thinking, and we must do everything to expand the space of democracy. Let us not allow these people to behave like previous uh, cabinet secretaries of interior. Who used to think they are above the law? Who used to think Senator... Senator Eddy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me opportunity to be able to contribute on this matter. Uh, just on a light note, I want to inform my uh, brother, uh, Senator Mungatana, that sometimes you don't need to be allowed to inform any member of this house. You know, some of us have taken time. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Speaker, I think this is a very serious issue uh, in this country. And I think that there's an attempt to uh, what we call excuse of mischief from the side where I, I, I studied. You know, and there's...